to put some ideas up uh, next semester. I know it's in September we'll do the Constitution Day as, <coughs> again, which was we had a, a panel discussion which went pretty well. So hopefully we'll do that again mm -hmm. uh, as our first one. And of course, let's let's remember that, that this is named after two of our most distinguished faculty of our department, uh, Kent Miller and Quentin Reeves, and we are graced with Professor Reeves today. Uh, Kent is recovering from some surgery, so he can't make it. Uh, we certainly appreciate him and his attendance. Now, 75 years ago today, the U.S. had just entered World War II. In fact, next week on April 18th, that is the 75th anniversary of the... Oh, I'm sorry, World War I. No, 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 100 years, World War I. 75 years, World War II. Uh, and, and on April 18th, it's 75 years to the day of the Doolittle Raid. So we were already well into it. Wake Island had already fallen, Guam had fallen, all sorts of things were going on. I, I'm not sure, I'm not, I don't know if the, the Philippines had fallen just yet at the Bataan, at Corregidor had, had surrendered, but if not, they were getting pretty close. And the fact is that while I'm not a, a World War II historian, I, I'm more of a Civil War historian, since John, Dr. John Flanagan, who couldn't could make it today, he's sick, um, did a presentation on Woodrow Wilson and, and, and it did a sense a bit of World War I last presentation. It sort of makes sense that we should do something about World War II on, on, on this presentation. And so I thought, well, I, I, I know a little bit about, about a, a camp for whatever Walters uh, from my earlier efforts. And I, I'd like to tell you a little bit of a story because people always ask me, like, why, why did you get, you ever learn about the history of, of Camp Walters or Fort Walters? And the story is because I have a no good old friend from grad school who asked me to help him out, and I didn't realize what I was getting myself into. Uh, not long after I came here, uh, by 2010, I think it was, something like that, I normally have to rely upon Tom for all the dates because he's, he's like a machine, he's like a computer on dates. Um, uh, not long after that, an old friend of mine from grad school calls me up. He's up at Texas Tech University, and he's got this couple of students, grad students. One's working on his master's thesis, the other's working on her dissertation. And, they're, and they've done this panel for the Texas Historical Association. They're crea creating one uh, on World War II bases in, in Texas. And he said, well, you know, you're at Weatherford. That's, oh, that's close to, to Walters. Why don't, would you mind being creating a paper on that and, and presenting it? And without thinking, I said, just to help out my buddy, I'm like, well, of course I'll help you out. And as soon as I get off the phone, I'm like, okay, I wonder what this Walters thing is. Because I don't know anything. I'm just, I'm brand new here. And, and then someone said, oh, well, it's over by Mineral Wells. I'm like, that doesn't help me at all. I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, luckily, there's this thing called the internet uh, that, that, that provided me quite a bit of, of information. And... And, and not only was I able to, to find some information here, find some information there, uh, there's a number of people I relied upon for a lot of, of information. One of them is, is here, uh, Jim Messinger himself, uh, is, 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 is certainly in some ways a historian of, of, of Fort Walters. Uh, retired Colonel Willie Casper, who lives in Mineral Wells, he has this wonderful collection of information at the Boyce Diddle Library in Mineral Wells. That's, that, if you want to know about the, that camp, you talk to Casper, and you go to the li that library. They know everything about it. They're going to help you out. And so they should be recognized for all, all the help that they, they gave me. Uh, also, John Vandegrift. I, I imagine some of you know John Vandegrift a little bit. He's a big supporter of the college. Uh, Brian Bagnell. I don't know if any of you might know him, but if you go, type in Fort Walters on the internet, it's going to take you to the first site. is fortwalters.com. That is his. Does this place have like an identity crisis? Is it schizophrenic? Uh, are they wanted by the law? I don't know what's going on. So I, and I'm, I'm trying to figure out, is this all the same thing? I don't know. And in the process of figuring that out, I realized that Walters actually has multiple histories. It's not just a history. And by looking at Walters, you get to learn a lot about American military history from roughly the 1920s all the way up to the, to, to the early to mid 1970s by examining these the, the purpose of the base at different times. And so that's what came across, is one of the things that really came, came out of it for me, was how this base is a reflection of American military history over the course of much of the middle portion of the 20th century. 
And you know, and I, I like this. I like this this little discussion because it's very easy for us to forget that we're part of history. That you know, we play our little roles. In some cases, really big roles. But here we have this major base that used to be very active. So I imagine some of you probably remember hearing the helicopters flying all the time back in the 1960s and 70s uh, over the area. I mean, that was part of the Vietnam era. Uh, some of you might even remember way back when, when it was perhaps Fort Walters or, or Camp Walters in World War II. Right? It's, it's part of us. We are part of that history. And so I, I like to, to look at local history and, and connect it to the larger history that, that, that it's a part of. So let's start our story with Camp Walters. Now, let's go back in time to 1903. The Spanish-American War just ended back in 1898, began in 1898. Splendid little war, as, as it was said. Um, and after the, the, and of course, when the war broke out, the Spanish American War broke out, there was a calling up of the American militia forces, state militias. And it didn't work well. It was very clunky. And it was realized, first of all, that, you know what, we need to, we need to clean up the militia. We need, you know, first of all, we need to stop doing this whole first Texas this and all of that sort of stuff. Um, and instead, make it all uniform. So there was a need to reform the militia system in America. Additionally, the US government, this is weird for us today, but prior to the Cold War, the US people and the US government really didn't like to have a big strong military, especially a big army. We kept it very small and very inexpensive. The idea being that, hey, we're, we got oceans on either side of us. Those, we're pretty, pretty safe. If anyone's going to attack us, we're going to know they're coming. And that will give us time to rally the civilian population, get them all trained up, and we'll fight them off. That's, that's sort of the idea. Uh, and of course, even in 1903, with, with Theodore Roosevelt being president of the United States and his big stick diplomacy and all of that, there's still very much an isolationist preference as far as foreign policy and not getting involved in other affairs, unless you're Panama or you know, some little country in the Caribbean where we can pound on you. Uh, but otherwise, we don't, you know, we don't want to mess with Europe too much. So there is this desire to keep the US Army very small and inexpensive. But there's also a need to be able to, map, to quickly expand it. But how do you, European powers are seriously expanding their armies, and in some cases their navies. The expectation of a war, a major war in Europe, is not that it might happen, but that it will happen. It is imminent. They are expecting it and kind of eagerly anticipating it, quite honestly. Uh, and so they're building up their military. So certainly the US military is going, we, we kind of have to have an ability to, to quickly build up our army from what it is to, to what it might need to be. And so we have the 1903, the passage of what was called the Militia Act. It's actually called the Dick Militia Act. And what it does is it creates the National Guard. So all these state militias, and it's up to each individual state to kind of if they're even going to have a militia, how they're going to organize it, that goes away. And it becomes the National Guard, and they're essentially organized much along the way the U.S. Army was. You no longer have these, you know, you're the first Texas Infantry uh, Militia. You're now the whatever regiment of, 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 of this brigade uh, in this division of the National Guard. So it's very different. And this allows, and by the way, that's, that's cheap. So you have a lot of guys that are essentially part-time soldiers, militiamen essentially, who, you know, they, they train a little bit every month, every, every summer they do a little bit more training. You don't gotta pay them a whole lot. You don't really provide them the particularly best equipment, whatever is gonna be cast offs from the US Army. Uh, and that's cheap. And so you can quickly take these guys that are halfway trained, train them up pretty good. Basically, you just gotta get them to do some push-ups and sit-ups and stuff like that. Get it back into the army, and, you, and you, you build up your army by a few hundred thousand men like that. That was the idea, and it, and it kind of worked. It certainly kind of worked in World War One, although obviously there was a, a much greater need or expansion as far as that was concerned. But that that takes us to 1920. Look, we would have had to wait this long for it to break. Oh my gosh. Anyway, um, I hope that issue was resolved with your students. So. Um, Probably not. <laughs> So what happens is in 19, in, in, I think it was 1920, 1920 or 21, the U.S. Army creates a, a, a new brigade 
for the Texas National Guard. It's called the 56th uh, 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 Cavalry Brigade, all right? And the issue is, okay, we got this brand new brigade. Well, you gotta have a headquarters for the place, right? Not to mention it's a, it's a cavalry force. You're gonna have to have stables, because at least once a year, they all have to come together. The whole brigade has to come together, and they gotta practice for two weeks of, uh, a, a year, right? We all, we're all familiar with how the National Guard works. And, and it was the city fathers of Mineral Wells, the same city fathers who were thinking, hey, let's build a 14-story you know, hotel, which was built in 1926. Um, these city fathers back in the early 1920s, they set aside 50 acres, they donate 50 acres, and, and they, to, to the military, to Congress, and they, and they petition Congress, like, Walters is established. Now it's named after the first brigade, the first commander of the 56th Cavalry uh, Brigade, uh, Brigadier General uh, Jacob F. Walters. The brigade is the, the, the brigade is headquartered there, and at certain times of the year, Mineral Wells is a pretty happening place. During the summer, when you have a few thousand cavalrymen with their horses all rolling in, I mean it's it's a big deal. Uh, they're, they're they're training there. They're working in joint maneuvers. As the years roll on in the 20s into the 1930s, that cavalry forces become less and less cavalry, more and more motorized uh, infantry. But nevertheless, they, they, they're, they're still somewhat cavalry. Uh, and everyone eagerly anticipates the end of those two weeks training, because now that at the end, what is the whole brigade going to do in a great big open field? They're going to do that great big party. Well, parade. Right? <laughs> parade first, <laughs> followed by the party. And, and it's quite the sight to see all these horses maneuvering and doing their turns and all of that sort of stuff. Uh, it was a big deal. So here we have, and by the way, does anyone know where the headquarters buildings, a lot of the original buildings for, for this base were? How many, how many have been to Mineral Wells? How many have driven by the high school? Where the high school is today is where almost all of those buildings were, set, were built. Most of them are, are, are gone now, but a few of them, as I understand it, are still standing. These little stone buildings, one, one, is still standing. And during the 1930s, uh, the WPA actually added to them, built quite a, 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 quite, quite a number of uh, buildings. So when we look at the history of Camp Walters and its inception, we, uh, we, we can examine it as far as what the military was at this time, the, ex, you know, the idea that kind of is supposed to be small. Uh, and, and, and be rapidly expansive. Also, we can look, look a little bit at, at this time and say, hey, this is actually part of, of, of a New Deal programs, uh, the WPA uh, in particular. So that, that, that's where we are uh, at this point as we go into, in, into this into this area. Now, by the way, the, the 56th uh, Cavalry Brigade had two regiments, the 112th, 124th uh, regiments. We'll talk about them uh, more specifically in, in a minute. I don't want to get, get ahead with myself. So this takes us, of course, and by the way, here's some of the pictures. Of, of, this is the, the, the entrance into the base. This is, looks like some stables over here, barracks. Uh, this is probably the house uh, for, for Walters, I would imagine, uh, right there. That's probably where he lived, uh, other commanders. But now we're, we're, we're moving toward World War II. World War II breaks out, uh, depending upon your perception, 1937 or 1939. Most of us believe it's 1939 because we kind of ignore what's going on in Asia. Um, okay. So 1939, this war in Europe uh, erupts, and in 1940, FDR, who was absolutely, well, he's doing everything he can to try to convince the American people to get involved in this war, and they're doing everything they can to run away from it. Um, imagine, you know, a, a dog that doesn't, isn't leashed, doesn't like to be on a leash, and it's trying to go this way, and he's trying to go that way. FDR's trying to do this. The American, the American no, no. But, he is able to get, because there is this expectation that the U.S. might get stuck in this war, that in 1940 he gets Congress to authorize, first of all, a, a, a peacetime draft. And not only a peacetime draft, but also a lot of the National Guard units are, are federalized for 12 months, uh, in part to help train up all, all these pieces. So hundreds of thousands of men are going to come into the U.S. military side. And you're going to need training bases for this. Well, the city fathers of, of, of Mineral Wells, yet again, I can't remember the name of the mayor. I'm going to have to see if I have it down here. Uh, but the mayor, John C. Miller, he leads this effort and petitions Congress to turn this, this National Guard base into an infantry training or re infantry replacement training uh, facility. And he gets it. Congress name allows this. 
And so starting in really the very, over about the course of four months, I think beginning in maybe December of 1940, finishing in, I want to say, March or April of 1941, they, you have thousands, well over a thousand construction workers descend on uh, mineral wells, and they work night and day. And in four months, they've built a base. They've built 300 barracks. So all, all those kind of older wooden buildings you see in, 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 at the base, the old base, they were built in four months back in 1941. So it's all built, the, the ability to, to have 17,000 troops rotate in at a time and be trained up initially in, in 17 weeks or four months. Uh, now as the war went on and losses got greater, the need for the troops was we don't need as much training, so it switched to three months training. Uh, but uh, when the U.S. enters the war, uh, this place is, is ready to go. And in fact, it, is, it was the biggest infantry tra training replacement center in all of America. So you went, you went there to get your basic training. You didn't get your advanced training, but your basic training for the most part at this location. There they set up uh, you know, all sorts of stuff. Of course, there's the barracks. I'm sure some of you have seen all of those. Uh, that's what, so this base goes from 50 acres to well over 7,000 acres. It it's very quickly expands. Uh, you have all sorts of, of places to learn how to do. Uh, one of the things they, they refer to it as, as what is it, hand grenade courts, which just sounds stupid. I just want to think that someone's with tennis popping it, you know, whoever loses the, you know, it's kind of a Darwinian approach to learning how to use a grenade. But, uh, all, all the you know, rifle ranges, there was a location so to give you kind of a, a real life experience for, the, for what it would be like in combat, they call it Hell's Bottom. And a lot of it kind of looked like a, uh, what, what would you would find in, in the Far East, you know, and in, if you're fighting, we were fighting Japan or something like that. And you could do bayonet training, and this is, there was really racist, but I've seen these mannequins where these, it's, you know, there's guys practicing putting in the bayonet, and it's, it's supposed to look like a Japanese guy, but with the coat bottom glasses and the button. I mean, it was really, I'm like, oh my gosh, you see it, you're shocked. But back then, it was just the way it was. Uh, so you do, you get this training, and quite a number of, of, of people go through uh, this, uh, through this base. Of course, we have, let's see, there we go, learn how to do mortars, learn how to practice how to get on and off uh, ships. Uh, that for them, they didn't have the ships rocking, so I guess you weren't, it wasn't as bad. Uh, now, I do want to mention uh, J uh, Jack Knight, Jack L. Knight and his brother Curtis. Uh, they had joined the 56th uh, National Guard unit, I think in 1940 or so, he was a lieutenant. And so he was part of what was called the 124th Regiment. There were two regiments in the brigade. Uh, they were quickly federalized in 1940. The 112th was sent off to, let me just move a couple of slides ahead, to New Caledonia. The 112th initially went to New Caledonia, which is an island down here, which you think, well, what's the big deal? Well, this is where the salt, this is where Guadalcanal was. And the Japanese wanted Guadalcanal because they wanted an air base on it so they could threaten the, the supply lines the convoys coming from the U.S. down to Australia to, to help the Australians and as well as MacArthur prepare to invade up this way, to get, head back toward the Philippines. And so Holy New Caledonia was a training facility, but it was also a place to help stave off Japanese occupations, because otherwise you'd have to send the, the convoys ever, ever further south in the, the water. You really don't want to send your convoys there besides Antarctica. That's probably not a good thing. Now, later on, they, 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 they were participating in the fighting in, uh, in New Britain. Here's Guadalcanal down here, this is New Britain, and in New Guinea. Uh, so they were, they were pretty heavily involved. Now the 124th remained a horse-bound unit. The last unit in the U.S. Army to stay cavalry was the 124th. They're not sent out into combat until 1944. But where they're sent is very odd. They're sent to India to fight for the, under the British commander, Lord Mount, uh, Mount, Mount Batten. Mount Batten. Uh, and and, and they're, they're, they're part of this effort to try to reopen what was called the Burma Road. Of course, there's the Himalayas. We all know where the Himalayas are, or hopefully we know where the Himalayas are. Uh, so here's India, here's the Himalayas, here's China. We need, to we need to supply the Chinese who are fighting the Japanese. The Burma Road, Burma is captured by the, by the Japanese. So you had for, for a long time, it was all these flights flying over the Himalayas to resupply, which is not a, a particularly effective way of doing that. Uh, so, so what the 124th was involved in is helping helping force that unit, 
forced the Japanese out of Burma, reopened that road. In fact, they actually fought in China. A lot of people don't realize that, but later on they fought in China. It's in Burma, though, that Jack Knight uh, earns uh, posthumously the, the Congressional Medal of Honor. There is uh, his four, he's commanding his, his many, I think he kind of said that, you know, if any of his men die, he's not leaving with them. He's not gonna leave without them sort of thing. And he's leading this attack upon a hill. The Japanese are entrenched on it, pillboxes, foxholes, trenches. I mean, this is not like a little thing. This is, this is a pretty deadly attack. He leads them almost single-handedly, takes, takes two pillboxes, two foxholes. Uh, he's badly wounded uh, in, in the fight. When he finds out that his brother is mortally wounded and is dying, he just continues on, takes out more before he, 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 he suffers some uh, mortal wounds and, and passes away. In fact, that, aisle, that hill in, in what's today, I, I guess, Malaya, um, is it, called Knight's Hill in, 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 honor, in honor of him. And in fact, there was actually 14 people who, who went out of, of Camp Walters or Fort Walters throughout the history that earned the Congressional Medal of Honor. It wasn't just one guy or two. Of course, the most famous, perhaps even more famous than Jack Knight, uh, the, the, the people that come out, came out of uh, this place was? Audie Murphy. Audie Murphy uh, went through just over there, got his basic training, uh, and then headed off to, well, he went to Fort Meade after this and got some more advanced training in, in Maryland. And then he went off to North Africa, and I think he was part of the 26th? 36. What's that? 36? 36. 36th Division, where they went up into Sicily and Italy and then southern France as well, earning more medals. And, uh, well, I think he earned more medals than there actually are medals, um, but he earned more. So what we can see here is that, yet again, Camp Walters is a reflection of another aspect of American history, and military history, and that is our experience in World War II. Uh, this, this little bitty National Guard base, which is really just a headquarters and some stables and stuff, transforms itself almost overnight into this great big base, Infantry Replacement Center. Uh, and, and, and they're sending out uh, seven, at, at their peak era, they're, they're sending out 17,000 troops every four months. That's about, or actually every three months by, by the end of the war. That's about 70,000 men are coming out a year of, of, of this particular base alone. That's a lot. Um, and so an awful lot of people who, who you, you might know as veterans from World War II, they may have actually gotten their, their basic training right over there. But after the war comes to an end, the base is, is, is deactivated. It goes, well, handed back to the Texas National Guard. Almost all the lands are sold back to locals. Uh, and the base, it just goes back to Camp Walters, this quiet, sleepy little Camp Walters as it was. But then, it's 1950. And what's starting to heat up? Cold War. And when I'm doing Korea, when I'm doing Korea, uh, for whatever reason, I don't really know why, um, for some reason, the U.S. Air Force, which has just recently been created, remember the U.S. Air Force originally was the U.S. Army Air Corps, and now it's its own branch of the service. Uh, it's just been recently created, and for some reason they established, they, they decided that, that Walters would be this Air Force base to be a, for, for an Air Force engineering force, really a training base for, for, for Air Force engineers. And I did that for a few years. It was still very small. One of the more interesting aspects of, of this time and afterwards was that on the hill, there's this hill in Mineral Wells, I think it's called Radar Hill or something like that. Um, there, they put in there a battery of a certain type of, of, of Nike missiles, a Hercules type. Now, these are surface to air missiles. Remember, this is the 1950s. There is no such thing as intercontinental ballistic missiles, okay? This is, so if you wanted to get your, your bombs, your nuclear bombs, to the other side, how are we going to get them there? Bombers. You're gonna put them in big bombers, right? B-52 bombers for us. The, 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 the uh, uh, Russians or Soviets had kind of their own. I think they kind of just stole our stuff. I think it was B, basically B-29s. And so there was a very real concern that the DFW area is a very legitimate strategic target for the Soviet Union at that time. Of course, you got Lockheed uh, is, is, is the biggest target uh, there. And so the surrounding DFW. In fact, if you look at this particular particular map right here, you, you'll see how this is the FW, it's the blue, 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 blue. Those are batteries of surface-to-air missiles, these Nike ones. Now, the original, uh, I think, Ajax not missiles, they, they were just uh, these, these regular old surface-to-air missiles. They go up, they have a big 1,000-pound explosive on them. They got about 25-mile-per-hour mile range, and that's about it. The Hercules, though, which is what was over here in, in, 
Camp Walters, or now Air Force Base Walters, these were the Hercules version. They had about a 95 mile per hour range, and they were armed with, where they were nuclear tipped. They, they, were more, they were twice as powerful as what was dropped on Nagasaki and Hiroshima. And the idea was, you launch one of these up into, uh, uh, you don't have to really be particularly precise, you have a, a, a whole, let's say 100 uh, Soviet bombers coming towards DFW, they're all gonna be flying kind of close together, ideally. You launch one of these things up, it blows up in the sky, what happens to all the bombers for 20 miles around? They all get incinerated. Now, yeah, everyone else gets radiated down below, but you know, do you want a little radiation or do you want a bomb dropped on you uh, that's going to blow you up? Uh, uh, so that was, that, that, so that, I always find that very interesting that we actually had surface-to-air missiles that were atomic bombs. That's just sort of odd to me, but that's what it was. Uh, so that, there's that part of the history of, of, of uh, Fort Walters or Camp Walters. Then we move into the Vietnam era. In 19, I want to say 1956, let me see if I have it in my notes here. Uh, in 1956, the U.S. Army decides they want Walters. Now, the, the, the Air Force was still there a little bit. Uh, but this becomes an Army base. And in particular, its focus is to be a training facility for helicopter pilots. That's it's the primary, it's, it's sort of what's called the basic or primary training, uh, training center. And so what you do there is you go there to learn how to, how to fly a helicopter. And you go somewhere else, you, you go to Fort Rucker, Alabama to get advanced training normally. Uh, but this is where you learn how to not crash, sort of thing, all right? And so you, you would go there, and, and so this is the Army's primary helicopter school. Uh, you would spend, normally, if you were an officer, four months of training, if you were a, 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 what's called a warrant officer, which is kind of the, kind of like a sergeant, right? Is that the, kind of the equivalent of warrant officer, kind of like a sergeant? In between. Okay, somewhere in there. So, because you, you, you did this, you had to yes. do the, the extra month, you had to do, because they had to train you how to be an officer, right? Something yes. like that. Okay, so you spent an extra month. Uh, and so, four months or five months uh, of, of, of training, and, and th there you would fly, you would learn. I think ultimately this was the most common type of helicopter, is that correct? That was the first one. That was the first one? It was outnumbered later by the uh, uh, Hughes yeah. TH-55. Now explain to me, why do, why do they like the round canopy and all of that? Beats me. You told me, I know. I did. Yes. <laughs> well, these particular helicopters are really good at hard landings, but the circle, when they crash, is less oh. likely to... Yeah, but that's that one's made out of plexiglass. The OH-6 was the one I was talking. Oh, about. that's what I meant. Egg-shaped. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, there you go. Yeah. So, it's made out of aluminum. So it's less. It, it, it's more. You're more likely to survive the crash, right? Yeah. Okay. But right. with the plexiglass round thing, not no, not so much. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, so uh, you have, have have, and this, by the way, demonstrates the growing importance of the helicopter uh, in the U.S. military as a tool. Now, a few things happen. First of all, in 1963, the U.S. military names Fort Walters as a permanent military base, which means this is not a temporary thing. This base isn't going away, which you should understand that whenever the government says something is permanent, you got about 10 years probably. That's, that's permanent. <laughs> but they say that. And of course, the, uh, just to kind of get off track a little bit, the, the, the poor city fathers in Mineral Wells believe this. And so they spend enormous amounts of it. They put the mineral wells into a lot of debt to a company, because you know, you're going to bring in a lot of families. You've got you to build schools. They have to massively increase the schools. They've got to run sewer lines. They've got to water lines, roads. They've got to expand the heliport or a helicopter or airport out there in order to help, help out. I mean, there's a lot of things they have to do. They spend like $30 million uh, on this with the expectation that it's okay that we go into this kind of debt because what are we going to get for the next gen or few generations? Yeah. A lot more in return. Uh, but there you go. So it becomes this permanent base, and as the Vietnam, U.S. involvement in Vietnam increases, the need for helicopter pilots uh, increases ever more. And so what, what you start seeing is, is, is it's just massive. First of all, the, the, the base expands dramatically, about 17,000 acres with all sorts of little base, little landing pads and all sorts of farms and ranches all over the place. Three main helioports for the, to accommodate the 1,300 helicopters that are going up and down every day. Uh, you, had, you had a group of, of men training in the morning, and then they would go home, 
uh, go to the training and the others would then come in and do their, their in the afternoon and the, the skies were just constantly uh, and in here were just li just littered with the sound of, of helicopter pilots uh, helicopters flying all over the place of course the roads were were, were full of the, the, the revved up engines of muscle cars as the pilots drove <laughs> back and forth from mineral wells to, to fort worth uh, because as the, all, more and more pilots are showing up and the base is getting bigger um, all of a sudden coincidentally all these car dealerships start going up in Rimmer Wells uh, and they're selling Corvettes and Mustangs and all sorts of stuff that seem to appeal to people around 18 to 22 years old that like to fly things and be aggressive. Uh, so there you go. Um, by 1968 this base was graduating almost 500 pilots a month. Because every two months, a new new group would come in. So you, even though you're going on four four month cycles of, of, of this training, so one group is already advancing while another one's coming in. So this means that every but at the peak era, this this place is putting out four thousand pilots a year. In fact, Fort Walters put out forty one thousand helicopter pilots before it was all said about. That's a lot of pilots. Um, uh, and, and what that happened is they would get their basic training here, then they would go over to, normally to Fort Rucker, and there they would, they would get their more advanced training, and then a lot of them were in Cobra gunships and Hueys, and they were off to Vietnam uh, and to, to do what they were going to do. Uh, so uh, this, was, this is kind of, a, kind, of a, uh, you know, it's kind of a big deal. But as we move into the early to mid-1970s, well, the U.S. gets out of Vietnam. Well, do we need all those other you need know, to keep training at that level. No. Not to mention, uh, the U.S. government wants to drastically cut spending on its military. So, well, what do you do? Well, do we need to have two separate helicopter training facilities? No. One of them is going to be consolidated to the other. And I remember I was talking with John Vandegrift, and I said, why, why was it that, that, uh, that the base here at Fort Walters went to Fort Rucker, not the other way around. And he, he said it, had, it was all about politics. And the right people were in the right committees in Congress, uh, and they were able, probably from Alabama, and they were able to ensure that their base didn't get shut down, that Mineral Wells or Fort Walters gets, is the one that got the ax. And that had a calamitous effect economically upon uh, Mineral Wells itself. I mean, before, about 1963, there were about 13,000 people in Mineral Wells. By 1973, there's 20,000. Sixty percent of all the population in Mineral Wells were either working on the base or working to service the people who worked on the base. Twenty-nine million dollars of private investment into building homes in, in Mineral Wells uh, during during that time. I mean, it's it was a big blow. Right? And I think before they cl closed down the base, there were 5,000 students in the Mineral Wells school district. When they shut it down, all these families left. It was barely over 2,000. I mean, so it was it was a, it was a big shock. When it, when it closed. But again, we can look at Fort Walters and we can see another aspect of our history, the time of our involvement uh, in Vietnam. And then when, when we move into the 1970s, of course, we got some runaway inflation, we got a lot of problems with, with debt, and so the government can't spend like they were spending. And there is also a pretty serious downsizing of the military, not a whole lot of spending on upgrading the military during the 1970s. It's one of the things that Reagan does in the 80s is like, we got to get things we got to get things a little bit better. We got to use new technology. We're kind of stuck with stuck in the 1960s as far as what kind of technology we're using. So as a result, uh, the base closed down. Closes down. I think I want to say 1973 or 75. Closes down permanently. And so that's the history of Fort Walters, uh, or Camp Walters, Camp Walters National Guard base, Camp Walters World War II, Air Force Base, and Fort Walters U.S. Army Base on the Vietnam era. Uh, so by examining this base that's just right over there, just 20, 20 minute drive away from us, we have a lot of our history, a lot of, of, of history that we've enjoyed, that we've experienced from the 1920s, 1970s. That was played up just, just over there in, in Menlo Wells. So that's my, discuss, that's my presentation. That's all I have to say. I really appreciate your time and there you go. Thank you. <laughs> if you have any questions or anything, we've got some pretty cool newspapers, all sorts of things. You mentioned the famous people from World War II. You should also include the infamous. Oh, the infamous. Private Ernie Slovak. Yeah. Oh, Slovak. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Dallas. But the the only soldier to be executed in World War II for desertion. <laughs> Trained out here. Oh, really? I did not yeah. know that. Yeah. Didn't know that one. I did not know that. Excellent. I taught you something. <laughs>
<laughs> Are there any other questions? Or? Well, I was just going to tell what yeah. I told you before. We used to go over there and get groceries when I was a little girl. Mm -hmm. so we'd be, yeah, we'd go to the commissary yeah. over with my mother and grandmother. Well, and, the basic school. Uh, and Bill was in the legislature. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, Senator Benson, Lloyd Benson, mm -hmm. called Tommy Creighton, who was the senator from that from Mineral Wells. Mm -hmm. And uh, Bill, of course, represented that area. And he said, do you boys want Fort Walters? Mm -hmm. And basically, they cut a deal that Dr. Mintz, remember, was here. <coughs> and they gave us whatever we wanted at the base. Mm -hmm. What Just, year was that? I don't know the year. My, my, that memory it had to be in the 70s, right? I came in 74. We already had the facilities. Yeah, so it must have been the first time. 72, 73 is when the fort shut down. So it would have been the early 70s. They, they, yeah. Yes. I, I don't remember. I think I think Senator Benson was offering the entire. What do you want? Yeah. And Dr. Mintz was real conservative, as y'all will remember. No. And he wanted just to take a, a little bit of it. So. <laughs> look up, look up conservative in the dictionary. You'll see his picture. <laughs> That's revisionist history, perhaps. I think one of the barracks is at the Anglican Church. What's that? I think well, one of the barracks is the Anglican Church. Is that the Anglican Church here in town? Yeah. Um, that's their, you know, community. It's called Barlow Hall, but it's, I'm nearly 100% sure it came from Fort Walton. Yeah. They just brought it over on a truck and stuck it on the church and, and property. Really? And the business, yeah. sure. Yeah. 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 And one part you left out was the laden wing. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that. And Woody, well, the blade, the blade wing was right around the corner. Mm -hmm. And is this a bar? Well, Woody, Palapendo was a, was a wedding. Woody was right around the corner. And Woody was oh. right around the corner where you could Just across the, the county line. Yeah. Just across <laughs> the county line. Oh, I did forget to mention, uh, while a lot of people in Mineral Wells enjoyed the base, the high school boys did not appreciate the base because they were having to compete with the girls with the soldiers and the soldiers had the money so there was no you don't know anything about that would you there was no competition whatsoever you want, you want to go out with a helicopter pilot or somebody from Mineral Wells <laughs> yeah, uh, at that time I was a budding musician and there was work constantly we played all of the joints really and you made you, we made decent money which at that time was 25 dollars a night mm -hmm. sure and, that was and, and uh, you cannot believe when it closed it was just you know overnight desolation yeah. mm -hmm. and just to just to blow my own horn for a minute the young girl that I picked up at the Dairy Queen in 1966 <laughs> will celebrate our 50th wedding anniversary oh, Saturday. Oh, really? Oh, wow. <laughs> I wonder, I wonder uh, at, the, at the bottom of the trough in population, I wonder what it fell to. Uh, it's about 16,000 now, is that right? I think, I want to say the number that pops up, it's either 11,000 or 30, I think it's 11,000. I think they dropped down to 11,000. I mean, you couldn't, they, you couldn't find anyone to buy a home or rent a home. A lot of people invested money in. in I mean, they, they, there were people who were up, who were fixing up chicken coops to rent out to people yeah. because there was there was such a demand um, because there was just no place to live. By. Yeah. yeah. One of the interesting things is how Mineral Wells seemed to really jump at and embrace the base. And it seems like Weatherford seemed to be a little, even though the ba a lot of the base was actually in Parker County, it didn't seem to be so so big into it. I just don't get get the sense that it was such a big embracer. Of it. My aunt uh, and uncle, he was stationed at uh, Walters during World War II, and he told her he was going to be there a while. Mm -hmm. And they lived in Whitesboro, up between Sherman and Gainesville. So she had been working at Camp House in Gainesville and came down, and they couldn't find a place to live. You're saying the chicken mm -hmm. coop. And by the way, the ones from Camp House, some of them lived in chicken coops mm -hmm. too. But she found a room in, behind this people's house, no bathroom, but it had a little stove. But it was so small that he had to get in bed for her to open the ironing board <laughs> to iron his clothes. Mm -hmm. uh, it was that small. Yeah. Yeah. I would think and this may be rude, but I would think that the money that Mineral Wells spent went back through the town 
with all of the Southern Airways and the soldiers and everybody that was spending money like water over there, mm -hmm. you know, the, the uh, Chevrolet dealer sold more Corvettes those four years than he sold in his entire lifetime. The money went back into the town, surely, what, what do you think, 20, 30 million dollars somewhere in the neighborhood? I, right? I have no idea. Look the, at the payroll. The issue is, did they, what do they do with the money? They yeah, they didn't the get money. back to the city coffers. They yeah. probably didn't get back to the people that invested it. The money went back through the town. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I got a question. Uh, somebody here probably knows. Where was the, I saw where there was a USO, USO club. Where was that located in Memorial? North, uh, North Main Street, just up 281, about uh, three blocks or so. The buildings now standing there? Uh, yes. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, uh, the uh, Crazy Water Festival Committee bought that building some years back. You know, I haven't been over there the last couple of years, but I think it's still That was World War II. Right. Tim, were you a pilot? Yeah. Did you try there? I did. What year? Uh, I went to flight school, uh, started flight school uh, June 1st of 66. Graduated uh, out of there in, I think, November of 66, and Vietnam in April of, or May of 67. How many tours? I did it twice. I enjoyed it so much the first time I thought it was worth going back. <laughs> <laughs> did you go to any of those two joints? <laughs> <work twice? laughs> no. You went to the Dairy Queen. <laughs> 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 you don't need to go anywhere else when you went to the Dairy Queen. <laughs> my, my, He's not, I don't know anything but the Dairy Queen. My girlfriend <laughs> was raised in a church of God and we didn't go to places like that. <laughs> well, one other interesting thing, I've, I played a New Year's job over there one time at the Officers Club yeah. and they brought a busload of young ladies from Texas Women's University oh, yeah, down there yeah. to the dance. Oh, yeah. oh. So, no, 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 it was actually, it was for the warrant officer candidates. The officers, oh, yeah. the officers generally had wives or Already girlfriends had. and they lived in Fort Worth and all that, but the warrant officer candidates <laughs> were, were preparing to become officers and there wasn't a lot to do with them. So at, at our graduation ceremony, they would import women from UNT and import. He has vision from trains. What is, what is that dirty dozen? Oh, yeah. 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 Maryland St. Clair is one of those girls. <laughs> oh, really? oh my gosh. They so. did train Vietnamese there too. They brought the uh, father in law also taught Vietnamese mm -hmm. get there to, to uh, block them. Oh, yeah. Yeah. They didn't have any prisoners of war. Not what? during Vietnam. No, in, in World War II they did. Yeah, uh, well, Camp Howe's had a tremendous amount of oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Uh, There was about 300 or so during World War II, and they were put in the old headquarters area. And they did a lot of cooking and cleaning and all that. They worked on farms in the area. They were paid. And, uh, and, and I, I shouldn't say this because they, they keep it hidden, but if you go to the Boyce Little Library and you go into one of the offices, they have a, a chair made by one of the German, some of the German prisoners of war that's really cool looking. It's, it's all hand carved and all that. It's, it's quite impressive, but I, I don't know why they're afraid of it. They, they don't want people to think that they're like German sympathizers. Or something. So, so. The war's over. It's okay. Yeah, we've past that. Yeah. Yeah. So. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Or all right. Well, we sure you appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Great presentation. Yeah. So is this going to be on YouTube? Well, yeah. uh, yes, it will be on YouTube, and it'll be uploaded pretty soon. I'm not even supposed to be here, and students show up. Yeah. And, yeah. Well, like they were showing up right at the last.